Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for, uh, for uh, taking your seats and uh, welcome to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. I'm Nick Childs. I'm the Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security here at the Institute. Thank you for coming, particularly, I suppose it's appropriately North Atlantic style weather outside, but thank you for, thank you for braving that uh, for our discussion today on NATO's maritime posture facing new challenges. Um, it's probably fair to say that it, it took a while for the penny to drop across NATO as far as the maritime dimension, the maritime implications of the, the new European security environment that we now face uh, <coughs> post-Crimea, post-Ukraine. Um, post um, but in some ways, it has now dropped in, in, in a significant way, to the extent that, of course, one of the most eye-catching elements of the new NATO command adaptation plan that is, uh, has been agreed is the creation of a, a new command structure focused on the transatlantic bridge and, and reinforcement across that as a way of regaining credibility for the NATO deterrence posture overall. At the same time, again, I think it's probably fair to say that the job of actually regaining NATO's maritime authority is still a work in, in progress, albeit that a lot of, a lot of uh, work has been done and overseen by our, by our speaker here, uh, but also the fact that uh, understanding uh, the character of the maritime domain now as far as the alliance is concerned, uh, is, is also a challenge. There are echoes from the past. There are skills that have gone unlearned, uh, have, have, have been lost and have been forgotten that are now having to be filled in again, that have been hollowed out and are now <coughs> having to be filled, filled in again. But there are also significant differences uh, in the laydown of the threats and the actual nature and character of the environment and the actors uh, operating in that environment. Uh, getting to grips <coughs> with all those new challenges um, and understanding the uh, nature of the environment in which uh, the maritime is, uh, is unfolding uh, is, of course, the job of, um, uh, of our speaker here this afternoon, um, Vice Admiral uh, Clive Johnston. Um, obviously, he's had a distinguished career in the Royal Navy, otherwise he wouldn't be in the position uh, that he, he is in now. But I, I would particularly like to say that, um, that uh, Admiral Johnston has, um, has perhaps gained a significant reputation before he, certainly long before he took up this, this post uh, as one of the most cerebral and, and, and thoughtful naval officers of his, of his generation and of his rank. And the fact that the, the, the previous post that he he held was uh, one of those sort of mythical positions in the Royal Navy, the uh, Assistant Chief of the Naval Staff, ACNS, um, that uh, has always been thought to be at the hub of you know, thinking about naval policy and <coughs> naval strategy. Um, he will make some remarks on the record, uh, prepared remarks on the record, and then to um, hopefully encourage uh, a lively discussion afterwards. Um, uh, the quick question and answer session will be off the record. So, without further ado, for <coughs> his latest thoughts on where NATO is in the maritime domain and perhaps also where it, it needs to go still, um, Admiral Johnson. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, Nick, thank you very much for such a kind um, introduction. I don't think I've ever been cerebral in my life, so, so that's a nice new one. Um, I, I, it's a great honour to be here, and it's really important I'm here talking to you as, as the maritime commander of, of NATO, but actually your maritime commander. And I'll come on to why that relationship is really important. But I recognise that ISS is, is putting together the Shangri-La Dialogue, which has become one of those vital and iconic components of the, the military and security <coughs> calendar. And, and, and thank Nick for his work in in uh, trying to move forward some deeper analysis into the modernization of the Russian military machine, and especially the maritime military machine. Um, I fear, and if you were to talk to thinkers like Andrew Monaghan, 
Uh, we may understand ourselves and the Game of Thrones that go on, but regrettably we don't understand the Game of Thrones that's going on in Russia at the moment, um, as well as other countries, and I think that's really important. Um, I'm sorry to be disturbing your lunch. I'll keep this to about 20 minutes, and then I'll be as honest as I can with questions um, uh, and see how we go. It's perhaps worth setting out who I am. Um, I am clearly still a serving Royal Naval Three Star. Um, I'm still a non-executive member of the Navy Board or, or, or an advisor to the Navy Board and Admiral Phil Jones, and I'm also an advisor to the CDS um, uh, uh, in transition to Nick Carter. I'm the commander of NATO Allied Maritime Command. A lot of people get it wrong and think I'm based in Brussels. I'm based in Northwood in a wonderful uh, synergy sitting between uh, UK Permanent Joint Headquarters and UK Maritime uh, Commander. And I sit in a little headquarters in the middle of them. That gives me access to a whole range of communications and conversations that you might not get somewhere else. And there's an element of UK leverage excuse me, uh, the international audience, that is helpful there. I'm equally one of three component commanders operating to the Supreme Allied Commander, General Scaparotti. Um, there are lots of other commands in NATO, but there's only three who have a direct line to him, and I talk to him probably about five times a week. Um, so that is a proper linkage and a proper command relationship. Um, my headquarters is small, or small for NATO. You always expect NATO to be slightly bigger than national headquarters. It's 302 people big, um, uh, and, and I am NATO's only operational theatre component commander. So last Christmas, uh, 17, Christmas 17, we certified to be a proper theatre operational component commander and have stood up in that role since then. Um, what does that mean in reality in the grubby tactics of it? Well, I'm commanding seven, six of yesterday, seven of today, uh, task groups or task units, um, uh, and they are engaged on operations as we speak. Uh, uh, one of them uh, just standing up in support of the Har uh, Harry Truman battle group. I am Sakyur's principal maritime advisor. I'm absolutely not his only maritime advisor. There is clearly an American line, and there's an international dimension. Um, I'm also NATO's maritime advocate. Um, that's, I think, NATO's maritime advisor. But, but it's our role of trying to pull the cats together and have a single maritime voice. And my headquarters, this 302 uh, uh, sort of rather mongrel-like organization, is slowly growing the authority and the responsibility for being the maritime hub for the whole of NATO. That is a journey in progress. Um, if I was to put that into context, where are we operating? Uh, a, a task group has just entered into the Black Sea of five frigates or destroyers or cruisers. We've just formed a task group of two, which will go up to three in protection of a Harry S. Truman. Uh, we have two task groups sitting off the north coast of Scotland at the moment, one focused northwards and an MCM group. And I have a, another MCM group uh, involved in mine countermeasures at historic ordinance at the moment. And then finally, as of tomorrow morning, we set up Operation Sea Guardian surge period where five warships will be split between uh, the coast of Tartars and the coast of Libya, involved in some uh, uh, intelligence operations and surveillance operations. If I was to multiply that into size, um, we have 12 high-end frigates and destroyers and about the same MCMs on task. I have, I think, five submarines under my OPCON at the moment um, and a range of maritime patrol aircraft. If you multiply that by the UK force generation metric 3.5, I have the second biggest <coughs> operational navy in NATO. Uh, so that just gives you a feel that we're quite busy at the moment. Uh, we sat down, Jim and I, to talk about what I would talk about now, just before Easter, and since then we've had nerve agent attacks, chemical attacks, a, a riposte by the P3, Haftar had his stroke in Jordan and is now in, in a hospital, we think still alive, but we're not quite sure of what condition in France. Uh, we, uh, in my headquarters, are very anxious about what is happening with Iran and Hezbollah, and of course politics surge on a daily basis. Um, you know, if you were to see that tempo and keeping the control of that tempo in the past, it's unrecognizable from pre-2014. Um, I think what I would like to do today is, is talk about how we collectively, because it is a collective, I'm only 
um, the sort of uh, the circus meister of of maritime power. It's how we change nat- maritime NATO into a more credible force. Um, and there are elements of hugely credible capability led at the moment um, in part by the UK. We have two flagships, Commodore Mike Cutley in the Black Sea in Duncan and Commander Justin Haynes in his flagship in Enterprise. Um, but clearly there are other people in command. But, but how do we convert that pinch point credible capability into a broader piece so that when a NATO task group rolls over the horizon, it is of a consistent level of capability that can do out and out war fighting? And that's something we're working on very hard. So today I'll give you a bit of a baseline. I'll tell you what we've been up to because we've been really busy over the last two and a half years. Um, I want to talk about how we're thinking about future maritime posture and the future threat and how we feel it looks. And we've done quite a lot of analysis behind that. And then I'll cover probably things that you're all starting to worry about, um, what the NATO summit might look like, what a NATO adaptation or modernization might look like, and maritime posture. So so let me just start with a baseline. I I think it's absolutely fair to say that pre-2014, NATO had lost its way, and pre-14, certainly my headquarters saw shape as the enemy. Um, Probably the operational trail was the paperwork between my headquarters and shape, um, and we certainly weren't a credible operational headquarters in any shape or form. Um, (coughs) Clearly, Ukraine gave us a shunt Um, uh, And and out of that has come probably the most consistent and comprehensive modernization process I've ever lived through. It it is very, very different from some national programs that I've been part of um, because at the moment every piece of adaptation we're doing is sticking and holding and we're meeting our targets and remaining steady. That's different. Um, uh, And... How we move forward, I don't know. Politics will have its play. Um, But, of course, I'm responsible for 28, now 29, heads of Navy. And so they hold me to account in a very tough way. Therefore, we do meet our targets and we do deliver. Um, There is still a feeling in some quarters that I am that um, rather unpleasant glass jar that your grandmother gave you and your wife only allows on the table... Uh, when your grandmother visits and, and you have to take on, off the table the moment it arrives. I think the consistent engagement of policy, the incis- uh, consistent engagement, engagement of policy makers into politicians is, is at best sporadic, and it's sporadic both in UK and it's sporadic across the world. But we're worrying much more than just the Russian challenge. Uh, my boss, General Scaparotti, talks about his four R's. They're slightly hackneyed now, but I think they still work. It's Russia, it's refugees, it's radicals and relevance. And every command board I sit on with him, with the three other commanders and the two joint force commanders, um, we're marked and analysed on those parameters. Um, And I think it is that complexity that sets the deductions, that sets the futures. So my task group, I have a task group at the moment in the Aegean, Uh, working with the Turkish and Greek Coast Guards and Navies, stopping migration. And we are now using those task groups to talk to the first time to security agencies and police agencies. And and for for a revolution in affairs, um, I'm now exchanging intelligence and information uh, with Frontex in Warsaw, as well as with the EU in various headquarters. Um, We are conducting maritime surveillance operations through this Sea Guardian surge period. Um, This uh, operation was the replacement or or, or complete uh, new operation after active endeavour, but it has rules of engagement and it has teeth. And I'm very happy to say that from a stuttering start a year ago, uh, we're now having to control the number of assets allocated to us because we we purely can't use them properly. And and we are now pulling intelligence data, um, uh, um, especially policing and security data and feeding it back to various agencies, including back here in the UK. Uh, We're particularly pleased with some of the fuel smuggling uh, data we've managed to get hold of. We're particularly pleased now our understanding of who tried to block us sharing that intelligence and information, because that's given us a very big clue of who's engaged in that fight and other people are now involved in taking that one forward. Um, 
We're also engaged very heavily in the Black Sea. I think this is one of our great good news stories. Uh, I have a regional coordination function in my headquarters now, five uh, officers from various Black Sea countries who now sit in their separate ops room in an office in my headquarters, led by a Spanish captain, a very, very high quality Spanish captain. And we are now starting to write concept of operation and employment of NATO and national units in the Black Sea and are then providing intelligence and information data to the nations and to NATO units and NATO nations entering into the Black Sea in a way we never did before. What we would want to do in the next uh, year, 18 months, is relocate that baby mock, that baby operations centre, into the region. But there's some conversation to be had with the countries of the region to decide where it's best to put it. Um, so we're very proud of that. And we're very proud of what we're doing in the Eastern Mediterranean at the moment, with especially Canadian other units absolutely front-loading the deep technical ASW battle and supporting the American carrier battle groups, but a lot else before. And in that scene, I'm working with Boeing and CMRE, the Intelligence Centre, and one or two other organisations to bring unmanned and autonom autonomous vehicles into the NATO um, uh, uh, orbit so I can employ them and have persistent maritime presence while the frigates and escorts have to go somewhere else. None of this has been easy. It's been a period of really brutal, aggressive evolution, um, and, and we found it difficult at points, and it's been hard to take some nations along with us, and it's been very easy to get cheerleaders who've helped us along the way. Um, our, our assessment, and one of the key deductions, is, is everything we've thought in 2014 is wrong, and, and the whole world looks different to us. Um, I think the maritime battle space, uh, the doctrine of old, the thinking of old needs to be totally refreshed. And we certainly in NATO, and we certainly in MARCOM are starting to do that. Um, uh, it is the maritime threats are just not binary. Um, they're not focused on one axis. Uh, they're to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And it's not just Russia, and it's not just ASW. I think instability, instability, migration, and terrorism, and particularly it worries me is the elasticity of the security and other environments that we're playing with, and, and becoming less and less elastic, are, 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 have all uh, are all a part to play. We're seeing threats that are both persistent and worrying, but fleeting and dangerous, and they're often coming together. And it's very hard to see what is the immediate and urgent requirement as opposed to the massive requirements that's sitting around us. Uh, my commanders have gone from supporting the P3 missile strikes to worrying about something in the north to now watching very care carefully the eastern Mediterranean and, and Iran and Syria. And they've done that in about five days. You wouldn't have found a standing naval group doing that in NATO, you know, uh, for uh, certainly back since the 70s. But the speed of it is something we're finding difficult. Our assertion is it feels like a new frontier. It feels much more like space and cyber than it does air and land, though air is the most similar environment. Um, and it is interesting because nobody has any experience of how to fight this battle. To us, as we've done a whole load of analysis about this, it feels like we're sitting on a very fast-moving chessboard, where the chess pieces can be to the west of Faz Lane, and they can be Russian f missile firers. So the threat axis is to the west. At the same time, there's a threat axis to the east, east and southeast. So how do you manage multiple threat axes when you're sitting in Faz Lane? As an example, it feels different. The second thing that feels very different to us is, is that um, we're in a state of open competition now. I'm very, very wary of talking about enemies and all the rest of that because I don't think we're in that game. But, but we are certainly in a period of pretty brutal um, competition, whether it's at sea or in our heads, and it's not theoretical. Our assertion, and, and this is from analysis, not from the headquarters, is that Russia is planning a strategic game and looking at short notice opportunities. And they are playing the game particularly well. And their commanders are being tested, and the commanders who are rising are those who have been tested and proven to be able to do the job. At the same time, we watch other people come into the area, um, you know, some of them with a right to be a presence in the NATO AOR, some of them who are worrying nations as I go about the country. Um, so these countries and these threats are robust competitors, 
And I keep on going back to it strikes us that there is less elastic in the negotiations at the same time. Every time we think we've got time to deal with a situation, it seems to be coming on very quickly. And so people are thinking of the maritime and are worrying about the maritime as never before. And the greatest institutional proof of this or recognition is that in the NATO summit under deterrence, there is a very major NATO work stream called Maritime Posture. Um, and we have been uh, a founding editor of a major paper that is now going through nations as I speak. And if the Maritime Posture paper holds, and if it is discussed in the summit, and we believe it will be at the moment, uh, that is very exciting because it allows us to have a range of other conversations that here too we haven't been able to have. There are a couple of com complications as, we, as we've staffed this process through. The first is the absolute lack of a common understanding of what the maritime is. It comes from the ridiculous of the first right of the NATO adaptation work where a national uh, general wrote the first paper and divided the Atlantic up into effectively divisional battle space. Um, and when I asked him, but how do the submarines move about? He had no real understanding that there were submarines under the water and aircraft on the top, and we were working in a three-dimensional space. And so we rewrote the paper from a maritime dimension. Um, so that it goes as ludicrous as that through to um, just the endless chip of, it's not policy makers or, or policy setters, but it's the briefers who aren't really used to maritime speak or NATO maritime speak. So there's a huge education process ongoing. The second one worries me, and that's um, what we call the grey zone effect. I think the environment is so cluttered and anxious, and people are nervous of the environment given the amount of other politics going on, that both physically and almost mentally we're walking away from problems, and we're trying to isolate them. We had a, a pretty tough negotiation about a year ago over NATO units approaching the Syrian coast when one or two nations said, let's not do that because we'll antagonize the Russians. And I said, but we're 45 miles off the coast and this is international water. We need to both sail in it and get closer. And that conversation was a surprisingly bitter one, which we won because I got the complete approval of, of the Supreme Allied Commander. But you'd have been surprised how nervous nations were. And I see that equally mirrored in our heads when I ask to do something, and I've now stopped asking, I just get on and do it, uh, how many nations are nervous that we are being agile and front of foot because we may unsettle somebody. Um, so, so we, uh, uh, as a consequence, have put huge amount of effort into maritime posture and maritime balance and, and deterrence in a way that I think we probably should have done 10 years ago, but certainly we're thinking about it very, very deeply now. Um, I think I'm going to sk skip a resume of, of what the world looks like because um, I want to close in a couple of minutes, but I'd just like to talk to you about the future. Um, everything about here is, is shrouded into we must deliver credible capability on the front line all the time. That is just not the warships rolling out or the uh, submarines or, or the aircraft. It is their resilience and readiness and their sustainability, uh, which I think would hold most nations to account. The key to this, and this is part of the modernization agenda, is this maritime posture paper. We believe this maritime posture paper is the key to being able to have conversations with nations that we've never been able to have before. And if it goes through, DSAC here will run the redness agenda for shape uh, for SAC here. And that is a very, very powerful combination. And we will tuck in behind him very, very tightly. Um, if you want some tangible evidence of what that paper contains and how we're thinking about it, we believe that we need to get hold of the standing naval forces, albeit they're growing, albeit there's more ships at sea now, but we need to give them a very big shake-up. I think we need something akin to a couple of striking fleets and a couple of slightly more um, uh, uh, lower redness training and, uh, and interoperability fleets. And we are going to trial one or two ideas in the North Atlantic next year to get at that. That leads into we need to change how we program these ships for you. Um, at the moment, we have to agree our program two years in advance. You will recognize that's crazy. Um, and so I've largely ignored it unless I am 
breaking rules set to me by SACIO and, and NATO headquarters, and we are changing the task groups around and playing with them. N nations are very, very happy with that. That's why they're giving me more assets. But what we want to do is make them much more f capability focused and give the commanders, who are absolutely first-rate commodores and admirals, give them more responsibility in building their programme. That's going to be quite a revolution. Finally, we're driving innovation in a way we've not been able to do before. Uh, we're endlessly looking for money to do this. I think everybody else has the same story. But we're getting unmanned wave gliders. We're getting unmanned air vehicles. We're getting other national capability working on behalf of NATO in a way we haven't done before so NATO can show the way and start to write content that you might find really quite useful. And let me lead into adaptation as the final canter. So um, adaptation or, or NATO modernization or whatever you want to call it started because nations desired a, a look given the threat. But General Scaparotti wanted to drive a complete change of behaviours into his command structure. And that's where it all started from. You know, we've, we've got slightly lost in a headquarters and, and numbers count, which is unfortunate. Uh, that, that is a second order issue. But the whole idea, in, in, and, I, and this is from General Scaparotti's handwritten notes I took from the first reading. He said he wants flexibility, speedy decisions, he wants it to be simple, he wants readiness, and he wants it deliverable now. And, and that was his, his initial scratching of what adaptation is. And we've been working to that, I think, in the maritime domain really successfully. I think we've had to fight our way through some politics. And I completely accept to some nations who say we should be leaner in our numbers, we should be. But unfortunately, when nations have 29 nations in them and want representation, you have to accept that some headquarters are slightly bigger than other headquarters. It just comes with the, uh, or comes with the beast. Um, after some in in interesting jockeying over the last three weeks, um, my remit is now clear. My headquarters will grow, or the, the proposal going to nations at the summit is that my headquarters will grow by about 200 people. Uh, I'm 302 at the moment. The figure being quoted is, is 482. And that's based on tough functional analysis. Uh, whether that holds will be a political debate. Um, I am going to be the maritime commander for NATO. Uh, maritime commander through peacetime, through crisis and tension. And the handover to another headquarters will be determined by politics, not by the military. Uh, that's a really important insertion, almost at the 11th hour, to give the politicians the ability to choose the next headquarter. And it is agreed that... Um, if we are starting to get very, very busy in a crisis that's growing out of control, I will hand over to a NATO force structure headquarters, either our higher readiness force headquarters, which I would hope, or in some areas or some locations to a, uh, a NATO force structure such as the Baltic Mock, uh, the German Baltic Mock, because they're ideally suited for the task. So, that, so we are trying to play for the greatest flexibility and a network of beings rather than having absolute things. Uh, and the interesting conversation we'll have, in, which I suspect you will want to ask me questions on, is how does JFC Norfolk, and it is JFC Norfolk, how will JFC Norfolk fit in? Um, I think at this point, um, uh, I would say that, um, and, uh, and on the record, I would say it's very much an American headquarters with a uh, NATO 3D, uh, a three-point plug. Um, and talking to John Richardson, the American CNO, and talking to Fleet Forces Command, that is how we're designing it. It may evolve into an Eastland, Westland type command, but we're certainly not at that point at the moment. Um, I think I need to stop now and, um, uh, and let you ask some questions. But I think what I hope you've got is a sense of movement and a sense of energy. I have never been in a headquarters where it's felt more like a start-up company. I've never been in a headquarters where, quite frankly, we've been negotiating, negotiating in stride with nations to deliver capability in the way that nobody's ever seen, been seen before. It feels very exciting and it feels relevant. You know, and I would ask UK operatives, as many other nations do, is just recognise the leverage it's giving you because it, it's doing that. Um, the, uh, the other, second point I'd like to stress is the maritime posture paper. If you are a staff officer or a commentator, please get hold of this paper. And there is an uh, unclassified version going around. 
it's, it's for a paper written at speed under tension. I think it's a very good paper. Um, but the key thing about it, it's an ambitious paper that opens a door to other conversations. Uh, and, and nothing is hard and fast in it, but it, it gives people a momentum that is helpful. The third thing I'd say is, in adaptation and modernization, please don't worry too much about headquarters and command relationships. They're dropping out and forming all the time. But please recognize for our supreme commander, and boy, he's a really good supreme commander, um, please recognize his desire for speed, agility, flexibility, because that's what he's driving for. So he has a fighting force he can truly use. And finally, um, I, know I can't stress enough that I am not NATO's maritime commander. To do that makes me isolated and independent. I'm not. I'm 29 nations maritime commander. I just happen to work in NATO. I also have uh, five or six operational partners who operate with me every day. Uh, 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 and indeed, you know, our, our, I have ships from various different partner nations on operations alongside standing groups as I speak now. And we are sharing intelligence with a range of organisations, the like of which would take too long to explore. Um, I think that's enough from me. Thank you very much for listening.